Welcome to the Retro Graveyard. This time we have the Technics SC EH50 system for the 97. I was keeping my eye out for a system for my son to use that was retro but not too old that would give better performance than something modern would for the same amount of money. Then this was offered to me, so let's have a closer look. Technics introduced mini systems as an alternative to the full size separates available at the time and were a lower end, cheaper product but still with that Technics name and reputation behind them. This system comes in four parts that can be stacked like this or two side by side. First we have the, as labelled, Acoustic Image Equaliser. The manual states that this has four preset sound modes, heavy, clear, hall and manual to adjust to your own levels. This part is the Acoustic Image Equaliser. The arrows move around to adjust the sound. Up for a heavier sound, down for a lighter, left for a softer and right to make it sound sharper. Next is the CD player, the SL EH50. And we have here the random button, the repeat, AI edit for when recording a CD onto a tape. When this is pressed, the CD player will calculate the length of the tape and will decide which tracks go on which side of the cassette, so the tracks are not cut off part way through. A useful feature. It has a small window in which part of the CD is reflected vertically and lit by an orange light in line with the rest of the system. Then we have the stop and the play button, skip and search buttons, the pause and the open and close button. Next is the tuner amplifier, the SAEH50. First the power button, then we have the clock timer button. To set the time and use with the play button to start playing at set time and the record button to record off the radio at set time. Then a 3.5mm jack socket, the tuning mode button and set for keeping station to memory, FM auto or mono, tuning up and down, the input selector and the band selector for the radio. Then there is the V bass button for a bass boost and of course volume control. Onto the cassette player the RSE 860. We have the counter reset and display buttons, a button to switch between decks, reverse mode, rewind, a button to play the reverse side of the tape, stop, play forward and fast forward. Then there's a Dolby selector, record pause and two tape editing buttons labeled normal and high. Normal is to listen while recording tape to tape and high is to record using high speed tape to tape recording. I can't demonstrate accurately how this system sounds, but I can say it would certainly be as loud as you would expect it to be. I'm sure an audio file wouldn't agree, but for the average user such as myself it sounds great and I have no complaints. It also has plenty of bass if you want it. And I just want to point out that this would normally have these gold trims, they are missing. It seems to be a common thing with these, they aren't attached very well. But I think it still looks great without them. On the back there is the usual power lead socket, and this is where the separate parts plug in with those flat cables. There's the usual FM and AM aerial sockets on the back as well, and of course the speaker terminals. This system also has an auxiliary in, plus a VCR in and out. The auxiliary and the VCR in can be used to plug in a turntable, but you will need one with a built-in preamp. You could also plug in a Bluetooth receiver, as I have brought for my son's system, so he can play music straight from his phone if he wants to. I found a listing in an old catalogue for a very similar system. This one is listed as a SCEH500. Anyway, it was going for £399 back in 1997. That's equivalent to £929 in today's money. If you'd like one these days, you can pick one up for around £80 to £100 in varying condition. Usually, they will have some or all of the trims missing, no remote, and the tape decks will more than likely need their belts changing. Also, always check the condition of the speakers behind the grills as they can hide the fact that the cones are damaged, like this. It's best to try and find this with all four of its components and speakers together, as separately they can cost a lot more. Before I carry on, I'm going to give the heads a clean because I will probably forget to later. On testing out the cassette decks, I find there was a problem. 
They will play a few seconds and then flip over and play the other side of the tape and then continue to do this in a loop. So it's time to take this apart and replace the belts. Okay, so I've never done this before, so this should be fun. So first of all, I'm going to open this up. There's one screw on the back and two on each side. And that's the lid off. I'm following a badly photocopied service manual to do this, by the way. Now to take the front off. There are some clips underneath and on both sides. Unclip those and the whole mechanism comes off. Now to take out the power supply circuit board. This is clipped in. I'll put the cover aside for now. Next to remove these shield plates from both sides, held in by one screw each. And now to remove the front doors. These just slide off quite easily. There are seven screws to remove. Here I am trying to undo a clip that has a spring on it and in the process the clip sprung off and the end of it embedded into my thumb. So I'll be wearing a brightly coloured plaster after this next bit to stop me bleeding everywhere. Here's a close up of the left mechanism where you can see the broken belt inside. And this is the other side where you can see a broken belt that has slipped off while the other one is still in place. In order to get to the part where the belts need to be, I'm going to need to desolder where the motors are attached to the board. I actually desoldered the terminals on both sides of the connector here and I didn't need to, but I can just resolder later. I just need to lift the contacts up here to make it easier to remove the board. And this just needs a little help to disconnect. A few more screws. And now I can remove this part that holds the motor. You can see the old belt has come with it. It's still intact but I'll change it anyway. The second belt has not been so lucky. And the same on the other side. Just having an inspection here to see if there are any other tiny bits of belt left inside. Completely disconnecting the motor assembly here to keep it out of the way. A few more screws and the front assembly has been removed. Now there are a few pieces to disassemble. First this flywheel, this just pulls out and this one. This part is called the winding lever, it has a spring and it's kept in place by two plastic claws. I just need to push it through from the other side. To replace the first belt I need to put it around these posts first and then onto this flywheel. I have to make sure that the wheel to the right there is in the right position according to the diagram in the service manual. It has to be aligned correctly, then a post that is attached under the wheel I am putting back into position 
will locate into the correct place. The parts of the belt that are on the post can be placed into a smaller groove that is under this flywheel with the help of some tweezers. Now I can place the winding lever back in, not forgetting the spring that came with it. And that just clicks into place. That flywheel goes back in there. And the second belt goes around this wheel and onto these two posts. Now to replace the motor assembly. And now that's in place, I can use the tweezers to move the belt onto the flywheel and then to repeat that process for the other deck. Next to place the whole assembly back with the front section. More screws. Next, place the circuit board over the motors and push these connectors together. Then screw into place. Now I'm moving the terminals back into position ready to resolder. And now the shield plates need to be screwed back on. This circuit board is reconnected. And next the doors are reattached. Now the front can be reattached to the back piece. and the circuit board clips back into position. Next to reattach the rest of the system, you can't see from this angle but the end of this cable has a lot of very easy to bend pins and I'm trying to get them all perfectly straight to plug them back in. I place the screw here and pop the lid back on. then realised that last screw wasn't supposed to be in yet. Ok that's better, last of the screws for the lid. Now to plug it back into the rest of the system. And that's complete. Time to test the cassette decks to see if that sorted the issues out. No problems with this one. And the other. Great, all seems good. A quick test of the fast forward and rewind. And all seems fine. Okay, so it's not a high-end system, but more than good enough for most people. I'd say for a system manufactured by a company with a good reputation for quality electronics, 
and with its 75 watt speakers, graphic equaliser, radio CD and twin tape deck, what more could have been wanted in 1997? I know I would have loved one back then if I could have afforded it. Only one thing missing for me would have been a turntable. Of course, if you own one, you could easily plug it into this system. So that was the Technics SCEH50 system from 1997. I'm off to see what else I can find in the retro graveyard. Thanks for your attendance.